And uh, just like I said, kind of a privilege to have been involved in the books the past four years. Um, but if I had one criticism to make of the devotes community, it's their modesty. <laughs> so we've been involved in trying to measure the health, not of Mr. Ocean, but the health of the spaceship Earth. So the extent of the area that we're looking at in the boats is globally significant. And the task that we set ourselves is extremely ambitious and not than the least audacious. So we have to do this on a budget. So how about this is a proposal. We have uh, one sampling site in the middle of our area of interest and we just really sample the pieces, do all the techniques we can and uh, find out every single piece of information and we revisit that every 72 months in order to be able to assess trends. No, I'm not getting much buy-in. So something more realistic now, we, we go to each of the reporting areas, the sub-regions, I and mean, we do the same super sample in each of the sub-regions um, and to, to get a handle of um, what's going on. Is there anybody who would vote for that? No, no, nobody voting for sampling. So the, the next thing is, uh, if we, we go and look at predominant habitat types and we take some kind of sample from each predominant habitat type uh, in each sub-region, and now we're kind of, yeah, this sounds, this sounds more yeah, more scientific. We're, we're sampling something that's that's out there and uh, plausible. But is it plausible? Uh, what, what, what do we expect these habitat classes to mean? How do we expect them to actually relate uh, to the broad spectrum of species out there? And uh, what, what are we hoping that we're going to actually be able to capture with these very low dimensional uh, uh, areas? It's kind of nauseating, isn't it? So, it's all about our perspective. Uh, what do you see there? <laughs> Something popped out to you, it all makes sense. Um, and it's incredible that how our, how our minds work, coming back to the same thing. Um, so we have these maps, and you can download them now. Uh, but I can tell you, whenever you log on from your AC uh, uh, domain, the people who made these maps are surprised whenever they see an academic downloading these, or a researcher, uh, they wonder why. Because these maps are not created uh, to do fundamental research. You can go in and, and have a look at the, the measure what they made. Um, so there, there are issues with this. And you think, is it that important? Well, let me do a little um, uh, analogy. Imagine you try to establish a relationship between the number of Italians and Italian eating establishments. And you get a very good correlation. You go back to a specific time and place, and you work out there's 20,000 Italians per Italian eating establishment. <laughs> London in the 1940s, for example. So that's good. We've got some empiricism here. And then we have modern times, and we're trying to work out how many Italians are there in the UK today. And we go and we are very careful. We count all the Italian eating establishments, and the, the, the easiest way we can do it is by counting pizza huts. 425 pizza huts gives you about 10 million Italians living in, in, in the UK today. So that's bad enough, but you end up with another strange anomaly. You take your impressive mapping skills to Italy and you map every single pizza hut in Italy. And you discover that in fact there are no Italians in Italy. <laughs> so this is funny, but as, as a habitat mapper, it's not funny. It's, it's not funny all the time. Uh, we, we look at, at relationships between different variables and the, the, the scale and, and the shape of the, the uh, analysis that you do has a fundamental bearing on the type of relationship that you find. So this is a, an inherent property of aggregation. Um, and we, we are very frequently not aware of it. So the same thing happens in, in social sciences. You look at GDP across Germany on the left, you've got the nuts too. And it looks like a nice east-west divide. If you, if you look at a higher resolution, you see there's actually more of a rural-urban component to that relationship than it first would appear. And this, this uh, um, relationship is displayed in different, in different ways uh, whenever you split up the area in different manners. So what is the resolution we want for the offshore area? We had a look at um, the spatial variation in uh, species composition. And we did a very simple model, not very accurate, but instructive. And it looks like the turnover of species that you could expect, probably one in every kilometer, roughly. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of beta diversity. On top of that, you have uh, variability, temporal variability, uh, in how species respond to 
uh, drivers and also life stage variability. So but you all know the complexity of the biology, but you put the complexity of the biology on top of the heterogeneity of the environment and we end up with something extremely complex. So what's the, the answer? Well, how about we start looking at variables that actually uh, impact the, the species uh, performance? Um, and things like uh, oxygen availability uh, or uh, the uh, yeah, borrowability, so how strong the sediments are, might be more relevant. Uh, I heard earlier on that you can have peripheral species, but what is a peripheral species? What is the, the scale of species distribution? I was shocked to find out that from the North Sea, um, the, the species distribution is essentially global. So how do you establish what is a peripheral species and what is a core species? and what part of its habitat you're looking at. Uh, this is unfortunately I'm not going to put. The relevance of this is that you can actually look at the, the genetics of the, the different species and their biogeographic distribution and find out that there are strong underlying trends related to uh, past events. So what is the, the main driver of past uh, environmental change? In Europe, in the temperate areas, it's glaciation. We are at a very unusual point in history uh, just now, so that the configuration that we have at the moment is not a typical configuration for most of what the, the tax would have experienced during their existence. So we shouldn't uh, yeah, be blind to that fact. Finally, uh, what are we looking for? More maps? Well, we're looking for a better understanding, and you can only get that by uh, approaching the system at appropriate bounds. So what are the appropriate bounds? Well, that little blob is actually all the, uh, the water that exists on the Earth. And so the distribution of that water across that uh, terrain is what gives the system its characteristics. And I think we need to have a think about where our cutoffs are and what levels of, of spatial and temporal variability are useful in helping us understand biodiversity.